Good afternoon. It's Monday, the 22nd of June 2020, just after one o'clock. Welcome to UK Column News. Your hosts this afternoon, Mike Robinson, myself, Brian Gerrish, and we're delighted to have David Scott with us just. And uh, he's giving us a Northern Exposure report from north of the border well straight on to a very slick looking um boris johnson uh, yeah okay this is uh this is a little bit uh, a little bit out of date the uh the video clip but anyway he doesn't looking not quite as dapper anymore uh but uh he is announcing today uh, apparently a move to a one meter plus rule from next month so brilliant news uh brian we will He's no longer be restricted to two meters distancing anymore. But one, one meter plus is two could, meters. Could, could be two meters. Mm. Well, uh, one meter plus a meter would be two meters, but plus is in there, isn't it? It is, absolutely. Uh, what did he say, or what will he say? He'll, you will be allowed to stand within one meter of each other if you have mitigation in place, for example, wearing a mask. Uh, um, he didn't actually say how you drink through your mask is your problem, but that's how I imagine he must be thinking because I'm not quite sure. I mean, this is clearly but, but, about pubs, so I'm not quite sure what we do about that. So you're going to be wearing a mask outside in pubs in order to drink? <laughs> possibly, possibly. In the beer garden? In the beer garden, yeah. yeah. Uh, and uh, apparently he will then say uh, that he will pull the handbrake if uh, this relaxation in the rules leads to a second wave. Uh, so, uh, David, uh, I don't even know where to start there. Uh, how many... Handbrakes, do you think uh, we're going to see Boris pulling? Well, as in handbrake turn? Well, probably quite a few. Um, this just gets goes from bad to worse. So we're going to have to be masked and muzzled in order to go within a metre or two metres. It's, it's just bizarre. And this is, of course, based on nothing. There is no science for this. There's no, there's no research. There's no considered opinion. There's no theory. There's no uh, sound modelling even. And uh, there's certainly no evidence, measured evidence. This is just made up. This is, so what, appear to be reasonably consistent? Well, he's failing. He's failing in that. As, as Nicola Sturgeon is failing in Scotland because you got all the pubs ready to open last week and then said no. And uh, a wag was suggesting that she should be singing a song, I beg your pardon, I never promised you a beer garden. It's bizarre. Well, it, it gets better uh, because HM Treasury uh, is considering a temporary cut in VAT to help the tourist and hospital, hospitality sectors uh, with their recovery from the shutdown. Despite this, uh, Rishi will have to consider deferred tax rises in the budget, according to the Treasury, if uh, we are to repair public finances. That's fantastic stuff. Uh, let's move on to this then. Uh, what else? Another, another announcement here. Matt Hancock. Uh, is announcing saliva testing. This is uh, fantastic stuff. Many people have been querying, having to shove swabs uh, halfway down towards your stomach and also halfway into your brain in order to uh, uh, run the uh, COVID tests. Uh, since we're apparently infecting each other by speaking in the general direction of other people, uh, many people asking why saliva testing wasn't uh, something wasn't sufficient, but apparently it is now going to be sufficient. So this is being trialled in Southampton uh, and uh, 14,000 key workers, uh, doctors, doctors, families, nurses, families and so on are going to try the test. Uh, it's been set up by a company called Chromon Chronomics, uh, which is a, a company set up by scientists from Oxford, Cambridge and University College London. Um, so uh, weekly tests can be completed by transferring saliva to a sample pot. So there you go. Isn't That's, that called a spittoon? Yes, yes, it is. Uh, but let's uh, come on then to uh, the other piece of uh, uh, COVID news today. That's uh, from Alex Sharma, uh, who's the business secretary, who's saying he's going to amend the Enterprise Act to prevent the takeover of critical businesses by foreign interests. So they want to make sure that anybody that's making critical stuff like masks or whatever uh, can't be bought up by uh, nasty foreigners uh, because uh, that would be risky to national security. But we are still rolling out uh, uh, 5G with uh, Chinese companies, Huawei and so on. Okay, we'll come, we'll come on to that. I just, just wanted to remark that you've got Man ha Matt Hancock there on screen, you've got Alex Sharma. These men have had their hair cut. Uh, well, no, 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 but in fairness, those aren't necessarily up to date photographs. Oh, but I've been checking, I've uh, been checking okay. some of these people and they are having somebody, somebody somewhere is cutting their hair. But of course, we know that the coronavirus 
is very, very dangerous in barbers and hairdressers. Uh, absolutely. Well, uh, David, you were giving some people a hard time earlier. Let's uh, come on to this with, in the mail uh, on Sunday. Uh, this is uh, Lord Sumption. Uh, these people have no idea what they're doing. Ex-Supreme Court judge Lord Jonathan Sumption uh, gives a devastating verdict of our political leaders handling of the crisis and he talks about plan a which is march the third uh, concentrating on ensuring provision of medical and other essential services relied on advice and guidance to the public not coercion uh, the government stood out against the authoritarian and indiscriminate measures which are being applied in italy and later in other european countries then it, they went to plan b an abrupt u-turn on march the 18th uh, and he's making the point that uh, March 20th, pubs, cafes, restaurants were added to the closure of schools uh, and then a full lockdown on the evening of March the 23rd. And then Plan C, which was unveiled on the 10th of May. They forgot all about that, apparently. By then, the NHS had caught up, uh, mainly as a result of the government's uh, one undoubted achievement, namely the rapid increase of uh, the country's critical care capacity. Now, this is the one area where I would disagree with them because, of course, uh, it seemed to, seems to me, and uh, you may have a different view, but uh, you can comment on that in a second. It seems to me that the reason that the NHS caught up was because they shut down every other service other than uh, the, uh, the COVID service. It wasn't so much that they expanded the, company, the country's capability, it's they shut down the rest of the country's capability. Um, and then... Uh, he goes on to Plan D, announced on the 10th of June, which involves a general return to work. Uh, but uh, in many areas, that return was stymied, he says, by the government's two-metre physical distancing rule. Uh, and then finally, he says there's the ultimate absurdity of the quarantine. Uh, and so this was his uh, general uh, thrust. Uh, you have to go back to the early 1930s, David, to find a British cabinet as devoid of talent as this one. Uh, is that a fair statement, do you think? Yes a bit hard in the 1930s I think um, because in the 1930s the cabinet maybe was poor but it was still being a cabinet it was still making decisions who's making the decisions now with the cabinet office uh, Mark said well it's not the cabinet the cabinet is simply um, the latest window dressing so I mean I thought it was broadly speaking a very good article and it, and it tracked very well the, the convolutions in government policy a couple of things that he didn't cover that I would add. Um, scientists were making decisions, and he was he was he was describing how the scientists were hedging their bets essentially, and the politicians were failing to make political decisions and weigh up economic consequences and things, all of which is true. But what he didn't cover was the failure in science of any um, obligation to existential truth. Right, and I would recommend uh, anyone who's interested in that to read this little book, Not Even Trying, The Corruption of Real Science. Um, and also, he's not covering the political bias of the scientists involved, because these are political decisions. They have a worldview, and no one's actually questioning that. It's viewed as though science is somehow above that, when it's clearly not. So there are even more problems than Lord Sumpton was uh, covering. Um, yes. Uh, it, it... I find it a bit interesting, and tell me what you think here, um, that what we seem to be seeing, what he's referencing there, isn't so much poor decision making as absolute chaos within the corridors of power. And we're seeing that on the Trump side of the Atlantic as well, with, with him in his executive role and his administration, which seems to be largely doing things different to what he wants to do. And so we're seeing what apparently bad results coming as a result of that. Is, is it fair to suggest that, that there's a similar process going on this side of the Atlantic? It's very difficult to know, but you could well be right. Chaos, yes, it looks chaotic. Is, it, is there a plan? Are we being manipulated? Is the chaos simply to get a particular reaction from the public? That could be, because we know they've used fear, uh, and we know that they've talked in the past about creative chaos. Um, it looks chaotic. Is it really? Um, no, probably. Uh, so let's uh, move on to north of the border uh, and COVID news from up there. Uh, remind us who uh, Devi Sridhar is. Well, Devi Sridhar is an advisor, scientific advisor to the Scottish government. And we covered this in uh, News Extra last week. And because uh, we received a tip that Nicola Sturgeon would do nothing without this woman's say so, and that really she was the person who was actually 
um, running uh, COVID policy in Scotland for all practical purposes. Now, she put out this little tweet. If COVID-19 numbers can be brought low enough in Scotland, um, then schools could reopen as uh, as normally as possible. Now, this was contrary to the stated opinion of the Scottish government. Right? And uh, a, a unionist uh, uh, commentator here said, can we have Ms. Shida doing the daily press conferences? It would be nice. It'd be a nice change if they were hosted by someone who knows what they're talking about. And I said, I would predict this will very soon be the policy of Nicola Sturgeon. This prediction turned out to be highly accurate because about 45 minutes later, Nicola tweeted the following. Um, she tweeted, um, right now we must plan for a school model based on physical distance. But as Devi Shida says, if we can suppress the virus sufficient, sufficiently and have other measures in place, neither normality may be possible. <laughs> so there we go, called it. Now, later on though, this obviously created a little bit of a storm uh, politically. So later on, Devi Shida came on again and she said, Nicola and Sturgeon and I are completely aligned and I support her cautious approach to easing the lockdown and reopening schools. And Ruth Davidson there, the Conservative MSP, um, say, suggested that someone got a hairdryer treatment over the phone. This must have been pretty much on target because it didn't go down well with Nicola at all, who tweeted out, untrue but more importantly, utterly disgraceful to suggest that a highly respected expert, uh, who I suspect has more integrity in her wee finger than some have overall, would be susceptible to that. So this, so it's clear that Nicola really rates this woman. She's highly respected. Uh, and this last, the last uh, slide there, we say, well, who's actually running COVID policy in Scotland? Well, there's Devi Shidar with her co-author, um, uh, speaking at the Blavatnik School of Government, and the co-author is, of course, Chelsea Clinton. Uh, and Devi's also in first name terms uh, with Melinda Gates. So who's running our policy? It's not Nicola Sturgeon. It's the Tax Exempt Foundations. It's Bill and Melinda Gates. It's uh, the Clinton Foundation. It's Wellcome Trust. And all of these influences via the scientists, scientific advisors and the politicians, they're window dressing. Absolutely. They're the puppets. They're the puppets. I'd like to just bring viewers and listeners back really to uh, Friday, excellent UK column news on Friday, which started out with this uh, graphic, which was uh, talked through. But we had a look at, uh, or you did, Mike, with uh, Patrick Henningsen, you had a look through this strange virus that was so contradictory because uh, it didn't really thrive in corporate supermarkets, but it did in local market stalls. Um, it didn't really go into Marks, Marks and Spencers, but it did go into independent shops. Bank tellers, they were okay, but dentists, hairstylists, very dangerous indeed. Takeaway coffee cups were okay, but bank notes were covered in the virus. So um, this little table here showed the sheer madness that was being pushed at the public. And I'm, I'm going to say very strongly, we've got chaos, but this is orchestrated chaos. This is deliberately um, created confusion and chaos. And why are they doing that to be able to control the minds of the public? So let's just have a look at how this chaotic policy affects people. And this is, I'm going to say, anecdotal but it's real reporting from members of the public. So we had this report about a member of the public who made a visit into a care home for the elderly. And this is what they had to say. I'll do it very quickly. And then maybe we can just ask a couple of questions. Uh, there were many COVID-19 warning notices. The main entrance to the building was closed. The new entrance, the COVID entrance, was via the tradesman's entrance. Authorised visits were limited to 30 minutes. You entered into the inner lobby of the tradesman's entrance. You were provided with a face mask, latex gloves and a plastic apron. You were escorted by staff to the relation to your relation in their own room. Then time's up. The staff come to collect you. You're instructed to leave the mask, gloves and apron in the waste bin of the resident's room. And then you're walked back through the same corridors to the lobby and exit. Would Do you see been, anything wrong with that, Mike? Would it not have been more sensible to put the mask, gloves and apron in a bin at the exit? Well, 
One would have thought so, but you put the mask on and the gloves and the apron, apparently, according to this person, in order to walk through the corridors to get into the room. You have the visit for 30 minutes and then you're going to walk back through the corridors breathing normally. Mm -hmm. That's pretty sensible. Now, um, the person said that the staff were lovely, so presumably they were acting on higher advice. They're confused. Mm -hmm. They don't really know. Well, we got this one. This is a report by, made by an NHS professional in a major hospital. We know that visits to patients are important and for some comprise a key part. Sorry, that should be a key part of their recovery. But we have no real idea when COVID-19 restrictions will be lifted and normal visiting will take place. The advice we get within the NHS is vague, contradictory and keeps changing. We think maybe towards the end of July, but we just can't say. Uh, yes, we have considered visits in the open air, but we can't get confirmation that this will be permitted. Um, they don't know how to get out. They don't know how to get that out of lockdown and to save face. And that's that last one. I think was aimed at the politicians rather than higher levels of the NHS. But David, very quickly, we've got a chaotic policy coming from the government. I'm sure that Lord Sumpton would say, oh, conspiracy theory or cock up. I prefer, I prefer to think it would be cock up. Well, I prefer to think that what we've got here is actually a political conspiracy. And this is adversely impacting on people's minds. There's no question of it. Oh yes, you, you see it every day. You see the people who are who are reacting to their neighbours as though they are a threat. It's it's been very profoundly affecting people's minds, and the fact that also everything is centrally controlled. So you've got doctors, nurses, well trained, thoughtful, intelligent people. We would assume that, that with with who are well motivated. They are not allowed to make any of these decisions. It must come from on high. Everyone must do the same. So part of the lesson is don't trust your neighbours. The other part of the lesson is do what the state says. You must comply. Indeed. Well, another graphic from Friday's UK column was this one. And of course, well, you can tell it better than, than I can, Mike. I, I wasn't I wasn't putting this across, but we've changed status down to three. Mm -hmm. um, so that says the virus is contained. R is less than one partial lifting of the lockdown. But actually what's going on at the moment is what should be happening in status two, where we're opening shops and offices. So if we ask a question, what state are we in? I'm going to say the state we're in is organized chaos. That's what the agenda is. But of course, as this government um, graphics shows where is it headed it's heading to a vaccine and there's going to be a bit more on that in, in the next few minutes but let's have a look at the effect on the population and i've brought in that wonderful little virus coroni that uh, you showed we'll animate coroni in a minute coroni's the naughty uh, virus top right on your screen but let's have a look at people we've got people who are fearful covid fearful they're frightened for themselves and the family. They believe the government and the mainstream media. They've adopted all the government's advice, social distancing, masks, shunning social contact. And as you've said, David, they're hostile to others who don't follow this advice. So that's one group we can see. We can see the COVID confused. They've got a bit of fear for themselves and their family and they're playing it safe. They've adopted some of the policy but they're less hostile to others who take a different view and they're unconvinced by some of the things. So we're going to call them the COVID confused people. Then we've got the COVID skeptics. Well, they're generally applying their own reasoning and common sense to COVID advice. And they're seeing some of the errors and inconsistencies, missing common sense. Um, they're adopting some of the precautions because basically they're law abiding people and they want to do what's right. Uh, and they're also doing it to save face, but they're sceptical. Uh, we've got the COVID unconvinced people. So they're not fearful of this virus. They understand some of the real statistics and the risks of normal winter virus. They're unconvinced of government warnings and advice, but they're doing their own thing. They're getting on with life, uh, watching what's happening, generally unconvinced. Uh, then we've got the parody brigade. Well, 
they're looking at it they're following gut feeling they're saying this is complete and utter nonsense and they think the whole thing is a joke they think the government's a joke they think the advice is a joke and the MPs are silly and there's no full analysis beyond that they're just laughing at what's going on and really it's all a bit of nonsense and then we get down to what we call the COVID exposers so they're actually following the thing analyzing it exposing the errors and inconsistencies the deceit in government the claims the statistics and the policy and their warning of a deeper agenda and they're challenging things and I think this is a very interesting section of society and I hope we're amongst that group of people Mike but let's look at how that animated uh, virus corona um, responds to this group of people well of course all the people who are fearful of this virus policy um, he's thriving he's winning uh, if you're confused this virus policy is winning if you're skeptical the virus is winning if you're unconvinced the virus is winning it's only if you're starting to laugh at it that that virus can't thrive and if you're exposing it it's certainly not going to thrive so I'm going to say that uh, if you can see that you fall into one of those categories you can get some measure of what really you need to be thinking about and doing if we are going to seriously challenging this deeply flawed government policy over COVID-19. Now there's clearly uh, quite a bit of concern uh, amongst some sections of society about the challenging that's going on to the uh, mainstream narrative. Uh, so let's have a look at uh, FTI Consulting here. They've published a report today, uh, The Real World Effects of Fake News, The Spread of Anti-Vaccination Information, uh, Misinformation on Social Media, Implications for Public Health and the Global Fight Against COVID-19. Uh, so they're saying that uh, the proliferation of anti-vaccination information on social media has statistically significant relationship uh, with vaccination coverage, i.e. when with parents' decisions to vaccinate their children. Uh, and that this relationship is not explained by the various co uh, confounding factors. In other words, it appears to be a causal relationship. In, a pic in particular, they say we find that when our measure of misinformation increases, e.g. by 100%, i.e. it doubles, uh, this causes vaccination coverage to fall by about 0.2 percentage points on average. On the face of it, this seems like a small effect. However, it's magnified by the significant growth in misinformation over time. Uh, over the five-year period from 2014 to 2018, misinformation increased by approximately 800%. Vaccination coverage fell, fell by approximately three percentage points. And our regression analysis suggests that over half of this fall may be due to misinformation. So, David, a couple of points there. First of all, I think if those figures are correct, it's slightly disappointing that if uh, the so-called misinformation increased by 800% because, of course, they're labelling as misinformation. Uh, many of the uh, arguments made by people that are asking questions about vaccines, whether they're correct or not, uh, if that only had a 3%, uh, co caused a 3% reduction in vaccine coverage, my first question is, why would they be getting so concerned about it? 3% doesn't seem massively significant to me. No, that is odd. Um... Why would they be getting so worried? Well, it's not really about the 3%, is it? It's about losing the argument. They have to shut this down because all of these people who are speaking so eloquently about the damage and pain and suffering and loss that their families have gone through as a result of vaccinations, if that's allowed to hit the mainstream, if, that's, if people are allowed to see it, hear it, they will respond and there is no argument clearly the problem is it, th these people must be silenced because the pro-vaccine lobby do not have an argument that can overcome what they're saying uh, absolutely now uh, let's come on to this little website infotagion now this is has been set up by damien collins mp he's co one of the co-founders uh, and there are quite a number of other british mps uh, an irish mp a uh, couple of mps from other countries involved in this uh, but these this website seems to be wanting to do for covid 19 what snopes does or or uh, full fact uh, sorry uh, 
Fact check. No, our friends. Sorry, it doesn't matter. I'll come right. back to that. Uh, but anyway, Damien Collins has set this up. Uh, and uh, so they are very concerned about this situation as well. Uh, here's what he had to say. Uh, he says that one of the problems uh, that we know we'll have to fight will be anti-vaccine campaigners exploiting social media's algorithms, trying to dissuade people from taking a vaccine that could save their lives. And I'm not, I have to say, David, I'm not aware that anti-vax uh, campaigners are trying to dissuade people from taking anything. They are asking significant questions. They're asking about the science. They're asking about the effects. They're asking about the contents. Uh, they're asking sensible questions. They're not trying to dissuade people that they shouldn't be taking any particular medication. Uh, they're asking people to answer their questions. It seems like a perfectly reasonable position to take. Yes, they're asking questions like, why is there no double blind placebo controlled testing that shows the vaccines are safe and effective because that's the gold standard for scientific research in this field? This is a good question. They're, they're actually quite scrupulous about not giving medical advice to anyone because you know, it's, it's, it's not what they're trying to achieve. Um, what they're wanting is is the facts. They want truth. They want people to be able to make decisions based on a real assessment of the risks. And they want to stop people being lied to, which is quite clearly been demonstrated to be happening. Um, huge risks have been covered up by the CDC and others. And uh, this is a scandal. And it's a scandal that this won't go away. Uh, absolutely. Now, just before we move on, uh, anybody that doesn't know who Damien Collins is, there he is back on screen. Uh, he is the former chair of the Department of the uh, Digital Culture, Media and Sports Select Committee. Now, he was while he was the chair of that organisation, he was campaigning extremely hard uh, to push for censorship and uh, regulation of the Internet and particularly of social media companies. That hasn't gone away. He's pushing that very hard. The, the uh, online harms white paper that we reported on at the end of last year, uh, the government still hasn't uh, produced their formal response to that. Uh, it's expected during the summer period. So sometime in the next couple of months, uh, we expect to see some draft legislation coming out on that. We expect to see uh, Ofcom being uh, made effectively a regulator for the internet. Um, but we need to see what else is in there as well. And uh, just a heads up for everybody to keep an eye out for that. Indeed. Now, what's remarkable is that reaction against uh, anti-vaxxers is not only UK. Um, let's jump across now. Apologies. This is Brisbane Times. So I, I haven't put it on the uh, image there, but that's where this article has come from. It says new COVID-19 restrictions will be needed for anti-vaxxers. And this is an opinion piece by... Um, a gentleman called Raf um, Ciccone, if that is the right pronunciation. So who is he? Well, he's a federal Labour senator for Victoria, Australia. And he said this to anti-vaxxers, I have one message. Our tolerance for your willful ignorance is over. We cannot afford morally or economically to give any ground to those who choose not to be vaccinated against COVID-19. Uh, let me be clear, I'm not advocating that we vaccinate people against their will. That would be wrong. We must ensure that the safety of our community is the number one priority. That means that participation in everyday life cannot put others at risk. If you do not want to be vaccinated against COVID-19, you ought to bear the consequences of that decision. So they're not going to uh, uh, vaccinate people against their will, but if they don't get vaccinated they won't be allowed out. Yeah. So the first question is, who is the we when he says we must ensure? That's who I'd like to know. Uh, but to answer your question, as a community, we should consider to what extent we allow organisations to prevent those who object to being vaccinated against COVID-19 to enter their premises, participate in their activities and in some circumstances seek their employment. So you don't want to take the vaccine. You're going to become an outcast, an outlaw shunned by society. And I'm just going to label this is a dangerous and very, very ignorant man because clearly he has no real knowledge of the dangers of vaccines. But uh, policy the same in Australia as UK. Could this be that the British government has been sharing its behavioural insights team expertise with the Americans and the Australians? And we've got similar things popping up in both those uh, other two countries. 
Uh, absolutely. And uh, just speaking of behavioural insights, uh, Brian, this was the type of thing the government was pushing out this morning. Uh, I'm Well, it's a very badly photoshopped image of a guy. They photoshopped a mask on his face. Uh, and uh, But apparently he's protecting shoppers and staff by wearing that mask. Uh, this is uh, behavioural insights at work here. Yeah. Uh, and the other thing, uh, we've got to dispose of our litter because that uh, by doing that, we don't put other people at risk. Uh, and uh, well, again, we've got another one. Uh, so this is the kind of stuff that the, that uh, number 10 has been pushing out on their Twitter feed this morning. Respect the outdoors, put your litter in the bin. And as you said earlier, he's today, wearing a new mask. Yes. That's one where it doesn't actually cover your mouth so you can speak and drink. No, or it's a beard, possibly. Oh, well, it could be the mask that Patrick showed on Friday <laughs> that has the uh, the clear plastic insert in yeah. it to make sure that you can see uh, what people are saying. But anyway, there, there you go. Now, if you like what the UK Column does, you'd like to support us, then please head over to ukcolumn.org forward slash community. There are options to help us out there, and that would be very much appreciated. Uh, moving quickly on to David Noakes, we've got uh, his latest contact information for anybody that wants to write and offer some support. His prison number is 457501. Uh, he's in Fleury Morosius Prison, uh, and that's in uh, Saint Genevieve de Bois in France, uh, 91705 is the postcode. Uh, 9 Avenue de Publia. Yeah, so Publia, you can. Uh, yeah. Uh, write to him there if you would like to. And we don't have any any up-to-date information as to what's happening in the legal sense. So we just know he's there in prison and we'll attempt to find out more. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, now, David, uh, obviously the big news over the weekend was the stabbings in, uh, in Reading and uh, BBC telling us what we know so far. Uh, all kinds of useful information in there, including the name of the alleged perpetrator, um, and uh, well, it turns out, as we can see on screen there at the moment, uh, he's thought to be a Libyan national uh, who was known to MI5. And uh, just again, we've got another person involved in one of these incidents that was known to MI5. Uh, it seems like a massive coincidence, but uh, the Telegraph uh, this morning reporting uh, that uh, his friends are claiming that he had mental health issues. Uh, and so I wonder whether that how much of what happened here was really about terrorism and how much of it was about mental health issues not being treated during the lockdown period? Indeed, I mean, it seems to link everything we've been talking about together. Uh, the, the media have been awful, uh, craven. Um, the Sky News report sounded like the case for the defence. Um, LBC said uh, that this, this man went into the park and shouted some words. That's all we got there, some words. And uh, we've had his brother tweeting that it's all because Britain is racist. So I think there is uh, some, some suggestion that the that, that BLM movement has influenced this man in some way. But what was his mental state? He seems to have had uh, medication for schizophrenia. He seems to be abusing drugs. He's got a history of violence, including racially motivated violence. So the whole system, he's been in jail for racially motivated assault but not deported. We we kept him. So the system's falling, fallen there completely, completely failed to protect the people of this country. And then the COVID-19 crisis has taken away any support or restraint on, on, on the individual concerned. Um, it seems to be a failure across the spectrum. Uh, absolutely. Well, many failures across the spectrum so let's quickly move on to this this is in spiked the culture war is destroying equality before the law david yes this is an excellent article by stuart wayton of Aberdeen university in dundee um he goes through a lot of evidence for this in the article and encourage people to go there and seek that out but he's somebody here he said in britain and the us the law is becoming an ass liberals historically held up the impartiality of law as central to what makes these countries great the system, at least in theory, was based on the key universal principle that all men and women should be treated equally before the law. Today, this has been torn to shreds as the culture war is incorporated into legal and police practice, making a mockery of the most basic principles of law. That is spot on from Stuart Wayton and, and a very key and important issue. And it was reflected actually by the Scottish Police Federation the same weekend um, now, they are looking at uh, disturbances in George Square in Glasgow, um, and they put out a letter. This is, this is the, essentially the trade union for police officers in Scotland. 
Uh, they put out a letter. They said, when our politicians fail to condemn the actions of those who defy the law, we cannot be surprised that it is increasingly difficult for police officers to, inf officers to enforce the law. The public cannot expect the police service to turn a blind eye to those who break the law in the name of a particular cause, whilst demanding different treatment for opponents. Now, of course, it's not just the public that's demanding that in Scotland, it's the politicians and the government that's demanding that as part of the politicised police force. So you he see here, you, you see here uh, some resistance to this from within the, the police federation, not within Police Scotland, not through the, the, the official command structure, but from the police officers themselves, they are seeing the impossibility of facing the public under these circumstances. Um, absolutely. Well, look, we're going to come on to uh, more Black Lives Matters issues in a second. Uh, but before we do that, uh, let's just let's just mention this, uh, because uh, a man in Scotland apparently has been convicted of uh, calling his ex-girlfriend's boyfriend a leprechaun, uh, an Irish man, of course. Um, now, I can't imagine that I would feel any way offended by that if somebody was to call me that. But David, how do you end up being prosecuted for this? Well, everything in Scotland is now possible. You can be you can be prosecuted for for, for telling a joke um, against the Nazis. That that's prosecutable. And here, yes, he, he called this man a, a leprechaun, and that was viewed as racially racially aggravated um, and malicious communication. And he was he was fined for this. Uh, so normal human discourse is now being judged in the most minute terms uh, against this unknowable. Um, pseudo moral standard and anyone who's found wanting will be prosecuted and of course it's not equal so um, it's it's a it's, it's a means of building up one group tearing down another pitting people against one another it it um, disrupts all the normal mechanisms in society where differences are worked out with a bit of humor uh, and, and a bit of a bit of conversation no it criminalizes all of that it makes society uh, a much more of, of, a, of a powder keg. David, this is cultural Marxism. Also, oh, sure. What, this yes, is what it is. Sure. This is Saul Alinsky. This is Marxism at work. And we're seeing it across the political spectrum. So the party system is over. It's gone. Uh, absolutely. Now, David, uh, uh, of course, the Black Lives Matter uh, situation continues to bubble. Uh, but it's not just affecting people that, that are being accused of racism on the white side of the argument. Uh, anybody that dares to question BLM that happens to be uh, from the same community uh, seems to be getting pretty heavily attacked as well. Yes, or in fact worse uh, in many regards. Uh, he, he's a journalist here, a uh, black journalist, and uh, she, her name is Esther, uh, Cra sorry, Cracu, Esther Cracu. Uh, conservative political commentator, and that's a clue as to why she's attacked. Um, she's speaking up for the ability of British people to, to have um, um, pride and interest in discourse about the, their own history. Um, and she's questioning the, the wisdom of Black Lives Matter with their anti-capitalist, anti-society, anti-police, anti-family agenda and good honour. How did they respond? Well, she received the worst racial abuse she had ever had in her life, um, including someone suggesting that they, they hoped she would be barren. So that's the nature of Black Lives Matter. It's nothing about Black Lives Mattering. It's something else entirely. Um, absolutely. Now, we're very close to being out of time here, so we'll, we'll run through a couple of these very quickly. Uh, but Peter Hitchens uh, was writing in the mail at the weekend, having received some intimidation. Is it fair to call it that? Well, he didn't think so, but he, he, he was uh, he was certainly harassed by a, a large shouting crowd. Uh, he, he said, I, I've seen hamsters more intimidating than the mob who shouted at me. But what is frightening is their intolerance of all other opinion. And in this, of course, he's correct. Um, so so he wrote, uh, yes, right. That's the headline. Uh, they had absolutely no desire to influence me or debate with me. Uh, I was an enemy, not an opponent. Uh, and so I should not have dared to be there. My actual existence infuriated them and possibly so did my refusal to be scared of them. Uh, that's that's a pretty interesting state of affairs. Yes, yes, th this is uh, th it's all about um, shutting down debate. It's all about silencing people and intimidating people. It's nothing to do with the ideas. It's nothing to do with what it claims to be about. 
um, it's it's a, a very dark agenda. Uh, absolutely. Now we were asking last week in this program on last Monday's program about uh, Patrick Hutchinson and who he is. But the uh, the other question that we seem to have a bit more information uh, about now is who is the guy that was being carried out uh, during the Black Lives uh, Matter protest? Yes. Yeah, so so Patrick Hutchinson, we, we found is quite an interesting character with a very strange CV and uh, a close protection team um, in uh, at his beck and call, which seemed odd. But Mr. The, the chap being carried is a, is a Mr. Bryn Mayo, um, and he's got an even more interesting CV. Um, uh, he, he was a British, uh, British Transport Police Detective Constable, uh, also thought to be in the Met robbery squad in the 90s. He spent a significant part of his 20-year career uh, investigating football hooligans undercover, and is said to have infiltrated Millwall's notorious bushwhackers. So he's an undercover cop who pretends to be uh, a football hooligan and right-wing extremist for a living. And that's the guy that they pulled out. That's the man, this undercover cop who knows how to handle himself in, 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 in crowded situations, in, in violent situations. Uh, that's the man who blundered in there in the middle of a BLM crowd and shouted an obscenity and got himself beat up. Really? Yeah, yeah, we're not buying that. Uh, no, we're not. Uh, but uh, you published uh, this um, a few days ago, do veterans' lives matter at the Ministry of Defence? Uh, just remind us what uh, why you did this. Well, in fact, the, the Daily Mail. That, uh, the, when did you publish this? This was on the seventeenth of June. The Daily yeah. Mail finally caught up on the twenty uh, second of June uh, with this piece. Andrew Pierce, top Mandarin at Ministry of Defence, in Black Lives Matter controversy. Just remind us what he had done. Well, he sent a he sent an email around encouraging all of the. Uh, positive things towards BAME, encouraging um, more um, recruitment and retention of ethnic minority people uh, within the Ministry of Defence and generally putting forward the diversity agenda. And he'd, he'd finished this, uh, hashtag Black Lives Matter. And he'd also been tweeting out hashtag Black Lives Matter. And he was then uh, questioned not only by us, I think by lots of people about, well, that means you support Black Lives Matter, but they're anti-British, anti, anti the society that we're in, anti-family, anti-capitalist. Why is the head civil servant running the Ministry of Defence supporting them? Well, that's a good question. Uh, he, uh, he then uh, took part in a telephone call. Was it a teleconference of some kind? Yeah, it's a teleconference. Uh, uh, this may have to wait until extra time. I'm not sure if we've time to play it just now. We'll, we'll, but, we'll, play, uh, we'll play it because it's only a minute, but, but we'll play it. But just just uh, set it up for us. Well, this was a this, this was a discussion within the Ministry of Defence for an audience brought more broadly within the Ministry of Defence. And uh, when it came to him, he immediately took up this thing. Well, what about Black Lives Matter and, and what he'd been doing to promote them? Um, and there was... Well, shall we say the sound of backtracking was loud in the land. Well, I'm going to open up by um, coming to Stephen first. Stephen, there's quite a lot of questions uh, on the Slido to do with uh, defence and the Black Lives Matter uh, movement and hashtag. And I wonder whether you might want to comment on that and say anything else that you wanted to in opening today. Sure, yes. Thanks very much, Siobhan. Um, uh, just to take the Black Lives Matter uh, point um, first up, um, when um, I uh, re-publish uh, or retweet the Black Lives Matter um, words, um, that what I'm doing when I say that is supporting the three words Black Lives Matter as a statement. It's not a, a political position whatsoever. Um, it's not a uh, gesture of support for any particular um, organization. Um, it is about the general principle of um, recognizing that at the moment there is um, a problem that we as a society sort of kind of need to um, fix. And I would uh, assume that people would take it in that, in, in that spirit. And if they, if they don't, well, that, um, this is the opportunity for uh, me to put that point of view and put the record straight on that, and also for, I hope, that particular issue to be put um, to bed. Uh, yes, <laughs> just astonishing. You, you put the hashtag 
you're supporting Black Lives Matter from an official position he's nailed his colors to the mask and then uh, I didn't I, I really he, I didn't really know what I was doing yeah he can't be that naive David he's not well naive. he's you, been caught with his pants down isn't yeah. he that's what's happened to you, him but, well yes I think you're right but he's making a really good a really good effort at the uh, I've been possibly naive defense because he followed this up with with a with a letter um after the one after the letter which which ended hashtag black lives matter he followed up with another letter right and, and this this one is even funnier is it <laughs> that's why some of the comments so it, they've had an online debate an online discussion which has been opened up to be viewed by a lot of people within the ministry of defense and the, the it, it hasn't gone well for him so your comments here that is why some of the comments that were posted online during the dial-in as well as others posted on the blogs have been so very disappointing and so many of our colleagues and for so many of our colleagues extremely distressing uh, many of the most harmful comments so these comments are harmful were posted anonymously and this itself calls into question why the authors felt they needed this cloak he answers that later in the letter but we'll come to that such as conflating indigenous with white britons but we are oh, never mind uh, and white britons needed to be recognized as different uh, as different within their own network and any focus on diversity is at odds with fairness in general so people are questioning whether ethnically quota hiring policies are fair i think that's a reasonable thing for them to be questioning but he says no it's hurtful and it's harmful um and and people are saying there's no implicit or explicit prejudice in the ministry of defense how dare they say such a thing uh, just as troubling was the fact that many of these con comments were heavily liked by colleagues. So here we see a little rebellion within the Ministry of Defence to say, we're not buying your diversity agenda. We don't think that we are, we are prejudiced against people with different colour skin. We think this is all a complete pile of nonsense. So he's not happy about this. He goes on um, that if it is clear who's been making offensive or discriminatory remarks, there will be disciplinary action. What, why do you think the comments might have been anonymous? I, I don't know. Um, <laughs> we, must have, we must have a department where everyone, regardless of background, feels safe to give their best self and the best efforts and the skills properly recognized and their individual, individuality and experience respected. That is unless you think that the department is not biased, in which case, you are a problem, you are harmful, and you will be disciplined. Now, on the surface of it, this is written by a man who appears to be stupid, right? Now, I actually don't think he's stupid. I'm sure he's got a very good degree from Oxbridge. And the question is, why does, does it come across as so contradictory, self-contradictory, incoherent, and laughably bad? This is the man running all of the civil service within the, the Ministry of Defence, he cannot put a letter together that actually makes any coherent sense. There must be a reason for this. And I don't think it's stupidity. I think it's worse uh, than that. Well, I'll, I'll propose a reason for this, um, because the policy that they're wanting to push is one of, discri of positive discrimination. Now, what happens when you push a policy of positive discrimination is that you put people who are not qualified into positions uh, just in order to make up a quota whether whatever minority it happens to be, whether it's Protestant, Catholic, as in Northern Ireland, or black, white, or, or whatever it happens to be, you put people that have not had the relevant experience, haven't got the relevant qualifications into a position in order to make up the numbers. Now, we've seen what happens when, uh, the, when this happens with, with a common purpose trained person, for example, we've seen it with... Uh, uh, our friend in the Metropolitan Police, what's her name? Proceeded Dick. Proceeded Dick, uh, because she ends up, well, we saw what happened to uh, de Menezes uh, uh, whenever she ran that particular uh, um, operation, is the word I'm thinking of. And we've seen many other similar types of, of situations with people that have been put in charge of, for example, border uh, control and so on. Uh, that have that are really unqualified for the job, but because there's some positive discrimination to get them into that job, to make up the numbers, uh, or in the common purpose case, uh, to to build the networks of common purpose people in the right places, we end up in tears. Uh, and uh, positive discrimination, when it's done for for religious or racial reasons, 
ends up increasing the divide between people as yeah. well. So it doesn't work, David. And I would suggest that's the reason that he wants to push it so hard. Yes, it, it destroys an organization. And of course, the organization is busy destroying and pushing this bizarre uh, policy into is one that's meant to be defending the country, which is quite an important job. You think the people in charge would be more responsible. Yes. Um, I think we should leave it there. Um, I think we should, which is a little bit of a shame because there's um, some really good material, but we'll introduce it into the news on Wednesday. Um, so we'll leave it there. David, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, troubled times for UK. And if you're watching or listening from overseas, of course, we've now got um, a government of occupation in UK who is really running the country. Well, it's clearly not being done through the Conservative Party. Um, it's being done through a completely different cabal connected with the Cabinet Office. And uh, obviously a lot more research needs to go into that. We'll leave it there. Thanks very much for joining us. Bye bye.